This is the Small Mouth Crush Podcast. Travis and his guest will discuss what it takes to consistently catch big smallmouth, and you'll get a glimpse inside the mind of a trophy smallmouth angler. And now, here's your host of the Small Mouth Crush Podcast, Travis Manson. Hello, welcome to the Small Mouth Crush Podcast. My name is Travis Manson. Another great week talking smallmouth bass. Digging it. Can't get enough. A lot of good information here on this podcast. We're talking with the top smallmouth bass anglers in North America for season one. And what a journey. Uh, we talked to some amazing anglers. Uh, anglers that just really know how to stay dialed in when it comes to smallmouth fishing. And today's guest is no different. Heath Wagner is going to be joining us. In fact, let's just let's just bring him in. Let's let's get this podcast slash YouTube video going. How are you today, Heath? Doing great, Travis. How are you? Good, man. Uh, super excited to talk to you. You know how to put a few smallmouth in the boat. And I really want to get inside your head, especially when it comes to tournament fishing, as well as anything else you'd love to share with us, Heath. But before we go there, can you give us a little bit of background on yourself, uh, you know, where you're from, kind of how you got into fishing and, and really kind of what your what your future plans are when it comes to smallmouth fishing? Well, I've been fishing since basically almost before I can remember. Uh, my grandmother got me addicted to it at a young age. I started tournament fishing. I think I fished my first tournament when I was 14 years old. Wow. That was on on Lake Tippecanoe. Uh, it was a tournament. I was fortunate. I got I caught big bass. It was like a six <laughs> eleven largemouth in that tournament. So I thought tournament fishing was easy. Yeah, one fish and a couple other ones landed us in like seventeenth out of a hundred boats. Got big bass. I thought, man, this is easy. There ain't nothing mm. to do this. And then I found out it wasn't so easy. Sure. When I was I'm forty six now. Right around when I was 20, I made my first trip to Lake Erie. The Bass Islands at the time were different than they are today. Ended up throwing an old rebel, sinking rebel, and just caught the fire out of all these smallmouth on Kelly's Island. And I knew right then and there that I was not going to stop traveling to the Great Lakes, northern Michigan, and chasing those mean brown things that were attacking mm. jerk bait that day. So I've been chasing smallmouth on Lake Erie for basically 26, 27 years now. Lake Erie, anywhere I can find a big old brown one, I'll almost travel to it if I get the opportunity. So uh, I started fishing Michigan Division BFLs. I guess what you would call a BFL veteran. I've been doing it for, I think this is this will be my 16th or 17th season. I can't remember, but I have not missed a BFL. Really? It's basically just a smallmouth beat down for the most part. Yeah. Claire, Detroit River, every once in a while, Burton Mullet up north, and a little bit over on the west side of the state, which are more largemouth fisheries, but they're mixed. That's that's my history. I've been chasing those things for quite a long time. Sounds like it. So 16 years, you said? 16 years in the Michigan Division of the BFL. But how many wins do you have? I have six. Six? six wow. Wins. There's a stat to that I'm almost as proud of as my six wins. I've had 11 co-anglers win in the back of my boat in 15 years. So cool. I've not only been on them a few times, I've had a few co-anglers I've put on them a few times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of that stat. Only one time of those, all those times have both me and my co-angler won at the same time. Oh, wow. So, yeah. I've had a few wins in the old Bass Cat. So the BFLs, I mean, it's awesome. I've, I've fished them in the past. I know a lot of the viewers are familiar with the setup. Obviously, there's probably some lakes that you prefer, Lake Erie being one of them and on the schedule. Do you have some Angler of the Year wins on that as well? well I have one AOY in my 16 years. I've only missed the top 10 twice. One time I finished 20th. One time, my first year, I finished 20th. Mm -hmm. And one year, everything went wrong and I finished 24th. So sure. I made the regionals, but every other year, like last year, I finished third. I've had several thirds. Third, third is a is a, seems to be a place I like to rest. That's my style. I'm if I think I can win, I'll bypass 18 pounds to go try to win. So that it makes it very difficult to win AOY, but I have done it once. What's your most memorable win? You know, on the BFL side. A few years ago, Drew Coang or Tony Mitchell. It's only been three years ago. The one on Lake Saint Clair. I weighed in a super sack, incredible super sack. I'll never forget that day. I'll never forget the number of four and a half to five pound small mouse I caught that day. I just remember one time telling Tony in the back of my boat, I counted. I caught 20 in a row and the smallest was 453. The biggest was 521 and none of them helped. I didn't have any of those fish in the live well. It was a pretty insane day. I ended up weighing 28 pounds and 15 ounces. From what we can tell, the largest sack ever weighed in in FLW 
history for smallmouth. Guys were mentioning it on stage. I actually left those fish two hours early. I, I lost one fish all day. It was about a six and a, six and a half or something at the boat that would have put me over the 30 pound mark. Mm. Had I known that I was that close to 30, I might have stayed another hour. Or so <laughs> they were still chewing. It just got better throughout the day. You know, walk me through leading up to that event. Did you have a feeling you were on the right deal? What were you thinking leaving takeoff in the morning? Where was your mind? I knew in the morning that 20 pounds wasn't going to cut it that day. Might not even get you a check. It was shortly after FLW tour was there and there was a school of fish, a special school of fish for this is post spawn smallmouth. So Hmm. To have that many six pounders roaming around in a school was insane. And I've chased schools on Lake St. Clair for a long time. I've never seen one with that many six pounders in it. A good friend of mine named Derek Sawyer, he lives near Windsor, actually Bell River. If anybody's familiar with Bell River Hump, he lives there. He's always out there. And he said, hey, this was the location of the school when the tour was here. And I believe Chad Grigsby weighed in a 27 pound sack. So I know that quality was in the area. But what happens was everyone chased those guys. They knew where those two little two little sweet spots were and of course i went and checked them in practice and this was a good two weeks later which is unusual for smallmouths to still be sitting on lake st Clair. i call it the seek kill destroy thing they come in there they destroy everything in their path and they move on and that's what they do on lake st Clair. i checked both these places and there's the fish are still there they're still fighting it's 19 feet of water i could look over the side of the boat on a calm sunny day and i could look down and see those fish sitting on their little places that they were sitting on and still set up. The problem was there was another 50 boats that knew where those fish were. So my strategy is always in a school is to figure out which direction they're heading before they implode. And you hope they don't implode before tournament comes around, but that's a school on Lake St. Clair is a one mile by one mile school. It's always one mile by one mile. That's just how big a school that is. And then you got to find the little sweet spots in between there where the big ones like to set up. I call them oases. They see them visually. Different areas of the lake have a different thing that'll hold those bigger fish. What I do in practice is I circle those key spots. The day before the tournament, I found a couple of very large schools no one was messing with, but they weren't quite the right fish. They were 21 pounds was sitting there, and that sounds great for most lakes. This is not the type of school that was swimming around over there. This was, you better have five pounders Hmm. or you're not going to win. My buddy Ryan said was guiding that day on Friday, and we were talking back and forth, and he says, well, I caught a couple of big ones in this area, but no concentration. So literally that tournament morning, I headed across the lake with all those spots in my back pocket. And I dropped down between a couple of waypoints Ryan gave me. I was now a mile and a half from where Chad Grigsby had caught them. There was 30 boats over where Chad was fishing. There was 30 boats where Dylan Hayes, they were fishing and those guys, you could hear them arguing. And I was sitting there all by myself. I was trolling across the flat. And like I said, 19 feet, but it was calm and sunny. You can see bottom. And I'm looking down at the bottom. I'm visually staring at the bottom. And in this 30 minutes, as I'm just flinging around, I catch 20 pounds in the first 30 minutes, just flinging around. There's just that many fish there. I told my partner, I remember turning around, looking at Tony Mitchell and I go, there's one right there. I says, I'm going to mark it. And I had not caught a fish off of it yet. And there's just little charcoal colored shell beds basically and i scott dobson and i've talked about it and we think that the bottom is cleaned in the winter by ice and current and everything and there's these real goofy looking places that the big ones will gang up on and Hmm. i told tony mitchell i said there's one right there and i trolled about 200 yards and i go oh there's another one now i had not caught a fish off at either one of those spots but they looked right i said those are right so i'm just basically trolling around you know watching for fish and i'm catching and we're both catching fish in in the meantime and about 9 a.m i swung back around and we both called to about 21 pounds and i says i got to go back and check those spots out from 9 a.m till I left. I got back to that spot. I hit spot lock and I said, Tony, it's right there. And that's when I caught my first six pounder. And I started catching fives and I would catch five to 12 in a row till the school kind of broke up and they chase each other in. And then I just trolled to the other one and I'd catch five to 12 in a row. Like I said, one time I had 20 in a row. If you left them alone for 10 minutes, they'd all wad back up on the little spot and I'd just turn around and go back and forth. I just remember my Rapala scale said 24 pounds, 25 pounds, 26 pounds, 27 Mm. 
pounds. And I was looking at my Rapals going, Tony, I'm just going to beam them from now on. I'm not weighing any more fish. I'm not even going to look. I had three fish over six pounds in the live well, but they were just over six pounds. And then I had mm-hmm. the five somethings. I made a cast at like 10 after one. One of the competitors had finally come over close to me and I was trying to pull them off because I had a tournament the next day. Mm. And I hook a fish at like five or 10 after one. I weighed in at three or 3.30, get it to the boat. And Tony Mitchell goes, Heath, that's a, that's a, that one's over six too. <laughs> <laughs> it pulled off right when he went to net it. And I go, ah, oh. you know, I kind of laughed about it because if anybody was going to beat me on that particular day, it would have been an incredible feat. I knew what was in the live well. I just didn't realize there was twenty, basically 29 pounds in the live well. Mm-hmm. That I land that fish, I got over 30 pounds, but we ended up leaving. Tony, my co-angler, I think my biggest fish that day was a 6'3". His was a 6'4". He had like 24 pounds, I want to say, mm-hmm. that day. I was actually telling him throughout the day, every time I'd hook a fish, throw up my fish, because there'd be 20 with it. Mm-hmm. it would double up, and a couple of fun fishermen were running by they seen us and they came in they were from south carolina or somewhere and they actually heard me telling them to throw up my fish and they started throwing at me and oh, one of geez. the guys in that boat caught a 741 on his rapalas off of one of my fish that i was reeling in so <laughs> i i told him i said hey man you know that particular day that was the biggest draw of boats in that bfl in years we had like 150 160 boats oh wow yeah like that particular one because the lake was on obviously mm-hmm. at the time and everybody wanted to get in on that you know i told the guys I was like hey man i said i need every one of these fish i can catch he, we were nice about it but like i said tony and i ended up both getting big bass we both won so we could have done no more than we did that day but mm-hmm. flirting with the dirty 30 really i mean our weights combined, we figured it up. We had like, if we would have been in a team tournament, we had like 30.6 pounds or something like that today, which right. me, I mean, I've fished Lake St. Clair and Lake Erie a long time to do that in a July tournament was mm. just, just crazy. And these fish were pigged out on craws and perch and they were eating everything in there. Mm. But anyway, that's, that's probably my most memorable, but they're all memorable. Well. I, can, I can detail every single win I've ever had out there. So. Yeah. Yeah. sounds like it. So the, I guess the technique of choice that day for you, what were you uh, using or was it a multiple array of baits? I caught every single fish I weighed. I don't know if I threw another bait. I had three drop shot rods on my deck. I caught every single fish on a drop shot with a TRD on it, a Z-Man. Mm. TRD and I just I had the I, it was the goby colored one and basically green pumpkin purple and gold and I just was nose hooking it on there I got down to where I only had like one bag of three left and I kept telling Tony it's not the color it's not the color and Tony says well why am I catching four pounders and you're catching six pounders I go I said I don't know try one and he of course he catches his six four on it he goes wow. it is color he goes but I don't want to use them up on you so anyways that particular day you sure. know how small mouth are that particular day that's what they wanted so now do you think the um, you know, these, these darker spots or these irregularities in 19 feet of water, if it wasn't calm, would you have been able to see those still, or maybe without sun? Without sun, you can still see them when you're directly on top of them. The, some of the biggest schools, uh, I don't know if you've ever been on St. Clair, Travis, but there's a popular area called the Metro Flat. And the Metro Flat is basically featureless. Mm-hmm. You can rarely see bottom on the Metro Flat in 18 feet of water. For some reason, that side you can't. The Canadian side you can. The fish that I caught that day were on the Canadian side. I call it the checkerboard bottom. It's sand, perch grass, sand, perch grass, sand, perch grass. Not heavy weeds wide open clean bottom if you get a little cabbage mixed in that's even better small clumps of cabbage that's awesome you will catch some fish off of that but when you see that sand perch grass sand perch grass all of a sudden you'll see this little patch of sand that's dark and it's charcoal colored i call it Mm -hmm. charcoal and if you get to get a real good eye on it when you get on top of it you can see the bottom looks like it's tore up and you'll see some mussels and shells shining in it. Happens every year. I would give those waypoints where I caught that 29 pound bag to anyone. You will never catch another 29 pound bag off those spots because what wow. happens is they fill up with weeds. You go back in August and all of a sudden you got all these junk weeds full in, in, in these things. It's just a timing thing and it happens at a certain time of year. Mm. And, 
It's when those schools are grouped up. I've won off of spots like that three different times in different tournaments on on St. Clair. Are you able to graph those fish and see them as well if you were just idling or not so much? You can see them on SI. The schools are so big, you can both see them on 2D. You can see them on SI. You'll see the little white marks on the SI when you get your SI tuned in just right. You can definitely see those schools. Live scope and the addition of live scope and forward-facing sonar has obviously everyone's been watching. They've seen what Mm -hmm. happened player that has changed the game you can go out there now and you si them so now i idle till i si them i'm looking for a clean bottom not a lot of weeds a little bit of weed then you'll see those fish just clustered or in movement the schools on st Clair are the biggest schools of smallmouth i've seen anywhere in the country anywhere Mm -hmm. i've ever been i've never seen such big schools and you'll see them on that si and then you drop now with live scope now you drop down now you get to specifically target them you get to see if they're smallmouth with forward facing sonar because if you watch it long and i've been doing it for two years and you can tell it's a smallmouth mm-hmm. <laughs> they move differently than other fish they you know you can see when a sheephead's coming across how he sachets his laziness if you vision i like to sight fish i'm a sight fisherman i chase the spawn all over the country i like to watch fish so watching to see what a sheephead moves like what a walleye moves like what a smallmouth moves like if you visually watch those fish obviously when you're watching forward facing sonar you can see the same thing on there so yes you can see it with your electronics you can see them with si you can see them on 2d and the forward facing sonar just completes the puzzle i do find them with mostly with si okay yeah a lot of time idling around looking for these big schools that are out there if you find a school are you Let's say it's someone that's just going out there that wants to, uh, you know, have a little bit of fun. They can only get out there on the weekends. Uh, you know, is that school still there the following week? Do they move that quick? It's about a seven to 10 day cycle. So your buddy just went out there on Saturday and the next Saturday he's sending his buddies out there. Those waypoints you might give them are only reference points. 99.5% of the waypoints I have on Lake St. Clair are junk mm. after week i mean there is a point every year where that school just explodes and they just now we're scattered now we're no longer in this post spawn let's feed let's eat everything we can find and they just scatter and they become harder to find but no it's about a six week period and Mm -hmm. all you have to do is find which way they're moving they're only moving to food i mean they're a small mouth they're all fat they're healthy they're just i honestly think they move across a flat and if you're a crawdad you're in trouble they're gonna Mm -hmm. i mean st Clair still has a great population crawdad unlike Mm -hmm. you they'll move across those flats and destroy everything and then they keep moving they're not gonna Mm -hmm. sit there if they ain't got anything to eat in my mind that's what they're doing right and destroy and then they just off they go off they go to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and then they just scatter i think they always had the current once that's over i think they had the current and they start to set up on current spots yeah no that's a great great approach mindset when it comes to it. what do you prefer lake erie or lake st Clair, or does it kind of depend on the year believe it or not after all that about st Clair, i'm an erie and i'm a detroit river guy st Clair river is real popular if i had one place on earth to fish I love the Detroit River. I love Erie and the Detroit River because I like rocks don't move. (laughs) Gravel patches don't move. All those fish on St. Clair do is move nonstop. So every time you fish Lake St. Clair, you got to find them and figure it out every single time. You have to do the same thing on Erie, but when you find them, they are so specific. And don't get me wrong, St. Clair, when you find those fish, they're specific for a week. Mm -hmm. (laughs) On Erie, Erie, I, I just, I like to pull up. I mean, the places that I've been on Erie, it's got some experience with a bass island, very experienced in Michigan water. Not a lot of guys are. Everything is so specific. When I pull up on Erie, my waypoint is where I need to set to cast and make the angles. St. Clair, you might run out to your little sweet spot. Like I said, the day I caught 29 pounds, I found those two spots that day. On Erie, that doesn't typically happen. Erie is all about graphing. You know, you have to work. And once you find something, it may not be good every year, but it will eventually be good again. You may not be Mm -hmm. having a good spot for 10 years, but then all of a sudden, wow, they're here again? Awesome. The Detroit River, you know, with the heavy current, spots typically are good year after year. Eyes changes a little bit every year, you know, the cycle of the smallmouth. I love the Detroit River because there is nowhere on earth 
<laughs> that I've ever been for smallmouth where you can sit on spot lock and fish five different spots that day and all five spots have the potential of producing 100 fish mm-hmm. without ever moving the boat sitting on spot lock. St. Clair is not like that. You got to move around a little bit and there's a lot of sweet spots where on the Detroit River, Lake Erie, they're here right now and we're going to crush them right here and we're not even going to have to move. I like the structure of Erie. I've always preferred it. Most of the guys I fished against over the years will tell you the same thing. Even though in a BFL, if there's 130 boats, 100 of them go north and head to St. Clair out of the Detroit River. Uh, there's play guys like me and Mike Tromley. That Erie holds a special place in our heart. It's where we love. St. Clair's awesome. Got mm-hmm. big fish in it. It is, and it has surpassed Erie. It used to be a three-year cycle. St. Clair would be good for the better lake for three years, and then Erie would be the better lake. St. Clair has just dominated Erie for a few years. Even though there's winds still coming off of Erie, St. Clair's in a little bit of a slump or the fish aren't biting. But when the big fish are biting on Lake St. Clair, and if the big fish are biting on Erie, you better be on St. Clair because your big giant bag potential. We're mm-hmm. talking 27 plus, they live on St. Clair. Your love for the Detroit River. I have a couple of questions when it comes to to fishing that or any type of, I guess, river system. Are you targeting fish in the main current? Are you looking for fish that are trying to hide from the current or is it actually both? Do they live in that main current as well as current breaks? Is it kind of a combination? It cycles depending on the season. The colder the water, they still relate to the current. However, they don't relate to direct current. They relate to what I call lesser current areas. Mm -hmm. When the water's below 50, if you cast your bait out and the current's moving it for you, that's too much. Mm -hmm. But if you move your bait and you know, I mean, you can obviously see the current. I'm saying 90% of the time I got a three eighths ounce sinker on something, whether it be a tube or, you know, I'll go heavier if the current justifies it but below 50 off current areas and there will be a lot of fish i mean i i catch small mouse in the detroit river from ice out till i've been there over christmas break and caught mm. it in the detroit river but it's always off current so as it gets warmer it's more direct current okay one of the secrets you know the detroit river you have got to break it down it's got many channels and everything and you have to break it down into okay i'm gonna just fish this channel or that channel or that channel and those fish the amount of fish that will sit on any particular spot is mind-boggling sometimes mm. i remember a day with mike klavinsky and my father-in-law were out there and it was nasty and we just sat on one spot it was nasty out and we quit counting at over 220 fish put in the boat and we mm. never the boat we just kept casting and kept catching them and never caught a five pounder all day <laughs> huh yeah you mentioned you love sight fishing does that play in the river as well are you able to visually see some of these fish cruising or is it a lot deeper early sometimes <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. I- caught fish off beds and bfls in the river there are a few areas where you can visually see fish and catch them i know the old trick that i learned from sturgeon bay the little hair jig Mm -hmm. it does play a role in the river you catch them on senkos top water top water is awesome in the detroit river sometimes but yet rarely but occasionally yes i do put a few sight fish in the boat and if we have a late spawn no matter what the first bfl there will be fish on beds in the detroit river i don't care how warm it's been that spring there will be fish left over over on beds and I usually utilize a couple of them when that comes and and like I said I chase the spawn across the country I'll chase the spawn up to St. Clair in the first BFL just so I can sight fish because certain areas of Lake St. Clair are colder than other areas and obviously that's river influenced by a Lake Huron that's dumping cold water into Lake St. Clair right oh yes i do sight fish any time of year most of the time i'm fishing deeper than seven feet out to 20 even out to 30 feet of water sometimes in the detroit okay river. i've been on the detroit river a few times i kind of want to compare it to the st lawrence river have you fished the st lawrence I, I assume you have i have not scott dobson's always given him you need to come over and fish the st lawrence you'd love it i says yeah i know i would i spent a lot of time on the water and i spent a lot of time traveling but I don't know. I don't know why I haven't been there. I have caught a smallmouth on every Great Lake, including Superior, except Lake Ontario. I have not completed my Great Lake slam on smallmouth yet. Right. How does the St. Clair River differ from the Detroit River, or do they fish very similar? No, they fish different. So the St. Clair River has a lighter colored bottom. So you can see down, it's more weedy. St. Clair River, that you catch a lot of big shallow fish and you catch a lot of deep shallow fish. And I have never been able to spot lock in the St. Clair River. The deepest smallmouth I ever caught 
came out of 74 feet of water out mm. of the St. Clair River. They set up in areas on the St. Clair River. They're so scattered around. They're set up on specific stuff, but there's so much specific stuff they set up on where the Detroit River they are set up right here. You make this cast and you will catch that fish. I do not like fishing deep in the St. Clair River. That's like watching the grass grow. It's mm. still fishing, but you're slipping current. And I know that's popular on the St. Lawrence River. I've talked to Chad Pipkins. He's a good friend of mine. He's done it several times where he slipped the current on St. Lawrence and caught him deep real good that way. That's how the St. Clair River fishes to when they go deep. However, mm. there's always a shallow population of smallmouth in the St. Clair River. And these are fish you can see because you can see out to about 10 feet and then the bottom falls out into the channel. It's yep. real clear most of the time, but it's totally different than fishing the Detroit River. No doubt mm -hmm. about it. The Detroit River is full of spots, specific spots. When I say full of, I'm talking probably have over 100 in my graph I might visit in a practice day. Mm. Where the St. Clair River, if you get up in there and you know where the fish like to set, everyone knows where those fish like to set. You can Google Earth it and see them. <laughs> so, right. Where you can't do that same thing on the Detroit River. The Detroit River is all figured out with mapping and understanding what the fish do in the Detroit River. Sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> well, are a lot of work that's why we love them yeah that's so true the saint Clair river and you kind of brought up a, a good point i think the color of that water is one of the most amazing places to fish for smallmouth as far as the beauty of the water and and being able to look down and, and see some of these areas where maybe the ice shelves have come through it's almost like the caribbean in some places it is beautiful. It's crazy. We don't even see that on the St. Lawrence River, which is obviously a gorgeous place to fish. So it's truly unique. Do you ever mess around with kind of getting away from the crowd when you fish tournaments? Do you ever start venturing into the mouth of Huron and past some of the boundaries where most people would fish and, and kind of look for that opportunity? Or do you kind of just stick to what you know? Nope, I'm known for that. I have never won any of my tournaments on Lake Huron. But I have ventured a long ways out in the Lake Huron and had success doing it, but never to the point where I've ran there on tournament day. I love adventure. I like new places. I always take a day. If I practice three days for a BFL, one of those days will be a no waypoint day. I will take all the waypoints out of my graph. I'm not allowed to look. I'll go to areas that I've never been. I told you I won six BFLs. Three of them were Lake Erie BFLs that I won. Three of them mm. were Lake St. Clair BFLs. So I'll go anywhere to do anything. And I like to do things a little bit different. I don't like to see boats if I can help it. I'm not saying I won't. I'm not opposed to it. I do it if I have to. But if I can stay away from the crowd, my wins on Erie that I've had in the past, not just BFLs, I've won the Wonderland tournament before and a few other of the big ones. I won't see a bass boat all day. One of the BFLs I won, I remember you could only see down eight inches in Lake Erie. It was muddier than could be and weighed in a big bag went back the next day and we won my father-in-law i won it's wonderland open used to be a big tournament they had out there we won that we had that tournament won in five casts it was over we pulled mm. up that spot in that muddy water and made five casts with a crankbait between the two of us it was mm -hmm. a and i looked at him and i said we just caught 25 pounds in five casts how'd you like that wow I mean, wow. and I never seen a boat that day. I like obscure. They had a federation tournament on Lake Erie one time when it used to be eight states. And I led that uh, dead fish cost me the win on the last day. I led it two out of the three days, ended up finishing second. And it was a late August tournament. The water was as hot as it could be. And I caught every single one of my smallmouths. And then when I say I caught the last two days, put upwards of 80 to 100 keepers in the boat both days. Mm. Well, that my co-angler from South Dakota the one day was at 75 and he was having Jeez. trouble counting. And we did not catch a smallmouth that day in late August deeper than four feet of water. Most of them came out of two feet of water. It was just a couple of little weird things that I do that a smallmouth is a visual feeder. And if you take his vision away from him, what does he have to do? He does the same thing a largemouth does. When a largemouth, either the sun comes up or it gets dirty, he's going to move right next to that log and get as tight as he can. The beauty of Lake Erie, to me, when the water gets dirty or it algae blooms or anything like that, those fish will pack together as tight as they can get. And when it's happening and it's muddy, I never see a boat. And I can't tell you how much money I've won in nasty, dirty, ugly water. Theory. I mean, I have places that if the wind is right, if everything comes together right and I see something muddy up, I'm like, oh, they might be there. Let's go check. 
<laughs> yeah. I don't expect you to give us the area, but can you tell us the baits that you're throwing when those conditions happen? Is it still, say, a tube or a drop shot, or are you using some type of reaction bait? Most of the time, it's a 6XD, 5XD crankbait mm -hmm. in water deeper than 10 feet. I like a 2.5. The tournament I mentioned, the Federation tournament, a lot of those fish came on a 2.5. We were mm -hmm. banging it off of, uh, of rocks with a 2.5. Those fish, like I said, were very specific. I only fished three spots, and we'd spot lock on each one. And then I do a follow-up. I've told a lot of guys, like the Wonderland tournament. We pulled up, I set up. We both had a 5XD, Green Gizzard 5XD tied on. And I told my father-in-law, I said, I'm going to cast my 5XD out there. Make sure your 5XD lands within five feet of mine, and we'll both start cranking at the same time. And we hadn't made a cast yet. I says, I'll, I'll net them both. So we both started cranking, and we both immediately threw three cranks in, hooked two fish over five pounds. I net mine, I net his, and we got two five pounders in the live well to have this thing I do on these spots. There's so many fish on them and you know how smallmouth like to chase each other out. Even in the muddy water, they're there, you just can't see them. I always dangle a tube over the side of the rail and I had one dangled for him and the minute I netted my crankbait fish, I tripped the bale on my spinning rod. I netted his fish, I tripped the bale on his spinning rod, ran back up, closed the bale, set the hook, handed him the rod, said reel this one in. I set the hook on his, reeled that one in. I couldn't get those two fish out of the net because they're tied up in crankbaits. And I uh -huh. netted those two fish. And we literally had four or five pounders in the net that morning. Wow. That's what I do. I catch them cranking mostly when it's like that. Mm hmm I still catch them yeah. on a tube, a Ned rig, and a drop shot. You know, when those fish slow down or you kind of pull them out, you break the school up a little bit, then I'll slow down a little bit and fish those specific spots. And they'll still bite that stuff. But yeah, it, my number one bait of choice is a crankbait when it's like that. Yep. In when you're targeting those fish that are chasing your hooked fish up to the boat and you're using that technique, are you free spooling that all the way down to the bottom or are you just letting it just yep. free spool and hit the bottom and just yep. hopefully one picks it up while you're dealing with the fish in the boat? You Usually, I've had this happen so many times, especially on those little areas. It's usually, I got a three eighths ounce tube, sometimes a half. Mm -hmm. I put the rod tip right on the edge of the rail so that the tube will fall straight down and nothing restricts the line from it falling. And a lot of times, I trip the bail right after I'll net a fish. You'll see the line take off. It'll never hit the bottom. It'll only go about three feet mm -hmm. and it's on. Yeah, it's all you can do to grab your rod before he spools you to grab it <laughs> and set the hook on sure. it. But I, to run across those schools seems rare but we run across a school like that at least once a year, sometimes twice. I mean, with live scope, it has really opened my eyes now with forward-facing sonar. Now I actually get to look and see how many fish are in these schools. And I fish a lot around home and I'm used to seeing bluegill schools. And some of the schools I've seen on Erie, I call them bluegill schools or crappie schools because they're just these massive schools of smallmouth that just blow my mind. Like two years ago in the Super Tournament of the BFL, I scanned a 80 yard wide spot with my sonar and showed my co angler. I said, Look how many are here. I said, That looks like bluegills. Those are all smallmouth. We started that tournament. I'd say we made our first cast at 20 after seven. We did not go without a fish hooked, both me and my co angler. Hmm. 30. That's how many fish sitting on one little spot. Man, a yeah. D and a drop shot. And, and then at 1030, a light switch flipped and I scanned the area and they were gone. Mm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. There had to be 2,000 smallmouth sitting in one little spot. Yeah. It's incredible. Jeez. It's incredible what happens out there. And this, the stories sometimes sound crazy, but the nice thing about a BFL is you got a co angler who gets to say, They can back it up. He ain't kidding. Holy cow, there was 2,000 fish sitting there today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Man. Well, he two questions I got to ask everybody who's on it. First of all, what's your personal best smallmouth? And give us a little background behind that catch. I have never broke the seven pound mark. What? Six pounds and 15 ounces is the biggest smallmouth I ever caught. I caught him on Burt Lake. He was on a bed. I caught him on a jerk bait. Funny thing about that whole fish, I messed up in my notes in that BFL the next day. And that fish was spawning in 15 feet of water. I accidentally gave that fish to my co-angler and uh, he weighed him in and he was six pounds and 15 ounces and he was the exact same weight on my scales when I weighed him but I have never caught a seven pounder hooked a few never caught I remember one fall in the Detroit River I 12 over six just that fall out of the Detroit River but mm -hmm. Never a seven. Awesome. If you had one bait, Heath, this is this is the only bait you can throw all year long for smallmouth. What would that be? 
no doubt about a swim bait. I would throw a Kitek, Kitek 3.3 in my hand. Why? Because it catches fish when the water's 36 degrees and it catches them when it's 80 degrees. There mm. is something about it. I mean, I've caught so many. I just know, I'd love to tell you Ned Rig because it catches them year round, but I'd rather catch them on a swim bait. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, so to me, yeah, a 3.3 Kitek, no doubt about 3. it. 3.3. And on a spinning rod, slow reeling it on six pound test. That's that will catch fish. I fish with. Uh, I live close to Greg Mangus. Most people out there, anybody watching this, knows who Greg Mangus is. I spend a lot of time in the boat with that man, and he has taught me that that little three point three catches them hmm. no matter what the water temperature. It always catches them. So I learned a lot from him. Let's take it one step further. Then, if you can have one color, Kai Tech three point three. I U A Y U. No doubt about it. Absolutely. That's my favorite for anywhere that I've traveled in the country. It catches them. IU catches them. Although with Greg, we get real particular on color and it's not okay. IU, but most of the time, 90% of the time it's IU. Sure. Wow. Heath, really good stuff. How can people, this got me excited. I want to come up to St. Clair in mm-hmm. Erie, like now, uh, how can people follow you uh, on social media? And if, you know, people that support you as far as fishing, if you want to uh, talk a little bit about that before we wrap up. Yep, I, I'm on Facebook, so find me on Facebook. I'll I'll friend you. You got a picture of a fish and a few of your friends. I'll friend mm-hmm. you on Facebook. Um, I don't post near enough. My social media game has been lacking for the last few months. I do have a YouTube channel, Heath Wagner Fishing. I haven't made a video in eight months. I promise I'll start making them again. Sure. I did some on Garmin perspective and live scope and stuff like that that were very popular. I also walleye fish. Those ones get popular, but yeah. Check out my YouTube channel, Heath Wagner Fishing. You'll get to see a few few walleye videos, few smallmouth videos, few up north smallmouth videos, which is my favorite place in the world is up north. Mm. So, yeah, check me out on my YouTube channel. Check me out on Facebook. Awesome. Good stuff. I really appreciate you uh, giving some, some, I mean, seriously, these are some awesome fishing stories. You know, six BFL wins. I'm sure you got another six in you uh, <laughs> in the future. So we're, we're going to definitely be following you. And, again, I want to thank everybody for listening as well. Thanks, for Heath, for coming on. No problem. And as always, until next time, we'll see you guys on the water. Take it easy, guys. Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure that you're subscribed to the show and follow us on Instagram at Small Mouth Crush. Also, the YouTube channel, Small Mouth Crush. And if you feel so inclined, please leave us a five-star rating and comment with a review below. And as always, until next time, we'll see you on the water.